A very warm welcome to you all uh, to our first panel, uh, which is called Educating Architectures, a Feminist Culture of Learning. Um, as architects and planners, uh, we are all educated in and for the patriarchal system. The Eurocentric male history of architecture clearly influences today's situation at architecture and planning educational institutions. Normalization makes it invisible. What is also passed on is the idea of how an architect is and has to be. Historiography perpetuates one model. Architecture in particular is so strongly influenced by ideas such as genius or talent, ability or inability. Women already make up the majority of architecture and planning students. Internationally, it's about 55%. But it's not just to tweak the numbers. It points beyond the mere question of quotas. Nor is it to replace white privileged men with white privileged women. So our approach is an intersectional feminism. So the matter is complex and it must therefore be viewed from several perspectives. Thus the theme of this panel is elaborating about four big questions and themes. Who, what, how and where in the architectural educational institutions. So who, it's about the white major, it's about the majority of white, able, uh, middle class, cis, men who are teaching a highly diverse group of students, a majority of them being women. What defines teaching? It is patriarchal perspectives and theories as well as almost exclusively man-made references that students are facing in the courses. How? Female students are taken less seriously, they're getting less speaking time, Didactical skills are considered superfluous for teaching teachers. Sexual harassment is not being addressed. Where? Existing academic spaces with their written and unwritten norms do not suit the multiplicity of others. So if we want to change something in the profession, we have to start 
at the universities. So there's a need to uncover the structures. And there's a need in how feminist futures can be learned and created together. We are convinced the changes at universities will make a difference in practice. For many years, individuals and groups at various architecture educational institutions have already been addressing gender equity and multiplicity. Specifically, in the last years, there has been an increased focus on this topic. Thus, for today's panel, we invited a range of national and international representatives, individuals and groups, students, teachers, heads and deans of institutions who are committed to making a difference by applying a feminist culture of learning. They will present various approaches and strategies to reflect and change Eurocentric male teaching structures. Our first presentation is by um, students of the TU Vienna, and they were analyzing and, and uh, doing some research on what the situation at universities, especially at the TU Vienna is, what challenges and disadvantages they do as um, students face, or they have to face, and what needs, visions, and uh, demands they have. Yes, they intensively researched this topic in the context of two courses of Sabina and me, and they will report on this. The second presentation is by teachers from the Academy of the Fine Arts here in Vienna, who will show us how feminist perspectives can be used to take a critical look at the teaching spaces of architecture schools, and in a second example, how you can um, question also what is taught to us, what um, technology is, but I find a very interesting aspect. Because normally it's said that the technique, so um, the cultural things are maybe uh, flexible and can be changed, but technique is objective and can't be changed, and that uh, you can also have a feminist view on technology. A third presentation will be um, by the Gender Task Force of TU Graz, and they look at how a gender-orientated and top-down supported approach at an architecture faculty um, can tackle change on all levels, can tackle change on all levels. Um, the fourth, fourth presentation by Brady Boros will come by video. She is from the KDH Stockholm and shows how important it is to address theory from a feminist perspective that underlies architectural education unreflectively. Her project has continued um, at TU Vienna. So this project that is here spoken about is that um, theory for architecture students, and she will tell you more about that, and this is also where you can find these fan scenes in the back. The fifth presentation should have been of Heiner de Jong, who was our first Claiming Spaces guest professor last year. Um, she was meant to show how the need for a change on social and spatial issues that accommodate differences can be the topic of design studios and projects. For these presentations, my colleague Susanne Mariacha will give a um, short explanation of the project of the design studio space of freedom we did together with Afina de Jong. Now, I will ask our students to come to the podium and start their presentation. Yeah. 
as students at the Vienna University of Technology, it is of course particularly important to us to show the extent to which sexism is widespread at our university. We ourselves are exposed to sexism on a daily basis. It's just hard to take you seriously given your height. Or when I look at your beautiful depictions, you're probably not interested in, in the technical details anyway, are you? These are just a few examples of quotes that have been thrown at me over the last three and a half years. You don't have any chances as a woman in architecture. After hearing this sentence from a family member, I was very insecure, but at the same time also very encouraged. Why not? Why shouldn't I have any chances just because I'm a woman in architecture? Until today, I don't have a reasonable answer to this question. Due to these and many more experiences, we both decided that something has to change immediately. Within the Transkill course, Women in Architecture and the Scientific Seminar, we were able to exchange experiences and ideas with other students. During the semester, 29 students dealt with when, where, how and by whom this female discrimination is committed. The following presentations will give you an insight into the alarming situation at our university. In our seminar group, we focused on the subject who. Who if not us? We did ask ourselves questions such as who does what? Who has experienced what? Who talks about it and who's allowed to teach? We conducted our own research to examine structures in group work at the University of Technology and to find out how issues of discrimination can be addressed and resolved in this context. Issues about possible conservative distribution of roles in group work in design studios were addressed. Questions about experiencing discomfort due to gender were answered with yes, as for example both communication and presentations are mainly done by male colleagues. Overall, it was made clear that the performance of students in design studios is strongly influenced by the gender. When it comes to the internal distribution of tasks between students in design studios, a clear allo allocation of tasks by gender could be found. Topics such as spatial impressions and atmosphere, as well as working on layouts, tend to be carried out by female students. Whereas studies on building technology and statics are usually handled by male students. These inequalities cause discrimination, which is perceived by both male and female students. In fact, 70% of students answered the question about having been discriminated against with yes. Almost 30% of them stated that their gender had been the reason for this discrimination. But who talks about it? We want to create more awareness. 92% of all respondents did not know that there are facilities students can turn to in case of discrimination problems. So let's talk about it. In particular, the first point of contact for students is the teacher who could have great influence on happenings around gender issues within a classroom. Therefore, we propose to have an open and guided conversation in every classroom about gender issues because they are only present. Thank you. Um, despite the various hurdles, a lot of women, transsexual and intersexual persons are uh, enrolling in architectural schools, and they will be more and more. And respecting to the diversity instead of denying where the everyone should feel safe and welcome, it actually reveals the systematic disadvantage of a target group um, and exposes this unconscious discrimination, um, even when it comes to a daily simple needs and we as a group were analyzing the educational space based on based in technical university of vienna and based on a 
um, daily needs that um, we do uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And first of all, we were defining our target group, which is, as you can see, it's women, transsexual, person, intersexual, and people with disabilities, as well as people with um, religious practices. Regarding to the need of our target group, um, um, we have analyzed how in inclusive is this existing building and how intersexual and gender inclusive the situation with the sanitary rooms are. And based on that, we found out that the sanitary rooms classified on different types and the common one is that the toilet is divided um, for men and women. And there are less uh, gender specified toilets and they're mainly combined um, or in combination with the men or women um, toilets. And they're usually located next to elevator and staircases, uh, which makes it easy to find. But the non-gender uh, specific toilets are usually located where, as a student, it's um, not easy to reach. Also, at some floors, it's hard to, to use sanitary rooms for people with disabilities, which, and at some floors, there's even none. So based on that um, needs of that diversity um, and diverse people, we came up with two ideas to make educational space more comforting and comfortable for everyone. And the first um, is adding to a common classified toilets, one gender specific um, or gender inclusive one. And the second is more complex in sense of accepting for everyone is to um, making one uh, gender specific sanitary room for all of us um, that and would we take into consideration the needs of all the diverse people and person with disabilities or different religious practices as well and my colleague will proceed with learning spaces um. So besides gathering our data through personal interviews, we also set up a survey um, that we spread among fellow students of architecture. This survey focused both on lavatories and on teaching and learning spaces. And some of the results you can see up here. I'll just point out, for example, that more than 80% of participants would like to have more say in the design of learning spaces. Based on the survey that we, um, that we set up, we developed a number of demands and actions. So we as students demand a rethinking of lecture hall seating to enable dynamic work environments, better group dynamics, flexible coming and going. And this can be realized very easily through flexible and various seating options, wider tables, and insular seating making frontal teaching a bit more flexible. We as students also demand a more welcoming setting in learning spaces to bring out our full potential. This can be achieved by making spaces quickly transformable via partition panels and interlocking tables, um, and um, using quality materials and more colors to make these environments more comforting and warm. We as students also demand a greater voice and influence for a comfortable study environment. Uh, an evaluation with students could be set up via an idea competition with a guaranteed realization of the winning ideas. And finally, we as students also demand adequate work tables and better digital infrastructure. We need proper tables and seating for each of our various activities from studying all the way to model building as well as abundant power sockets for our electrical and electronic equipment. Um, actions such as these are very easy and quick to implement and will thoroughly and immediately improve our learning spaces at the university and make them more safe, comforting, and inclusive. So I also had a closer look on the learning envi environments at our faculty, and in particular, how a diverse and intersectional learning environment should look like. 
The basis of my investigation were the conversations with students. 10% didn't feel comfortable or not as a member of the university. 13% already experienced exclusion or harassment in our rooms. And for 28%, our university is not a safe space or a space where they could freely unfold. One would expect that the university provides us with such a safe space or rooms that encourage us to be creative and communicative. But having a close look, it seems that the rooms are designed for a gray and universal mass of students without taking into account their individual needs. Indeed, architects and architecture students in particular are mostly affected by burnout symptoms, not only because of the high workload, but also because of the workspace itself. But doesn't architecture psychology teach us the huge impact the space has on creative, um, creative processes and well-being? If rooms are adequately designed, they can bring people together. They can increase motivation, connect students, and make them appropriate a room. Sentences as, due to the lack of contact with other students, I lose my interest in studying, or if there would be a room where I could read a book, I'd like to go to university much more, show how big the wish for exchange on the one hand, but also for retreat on the other hand is. What we need are safe, sustainable, and inclusive spaces, no matter the age, gender, origin, religion, or disability. And this could also be reflected in the design itself. We students want to co-design, form our rooms together. We want to identify ourselves with them and return to them with pleasure. Thank you. Um, we have talked with different people and each other and found out that even each one of us uh, was at least once discriminated during our studies at TU Vienna and felt that we weren't belong to society because of our social role. The role which decided by society as gender, sexual orientation, origin and even appearances. We have divided the experiences that we have collected into four teams. Those are structural uh, discrimination, problematic assignments, treatment, and privileges. These experiences are only the tip of iceberg. There are still innumerable experiences which we unfortunately weren't able to get to know. Because those who have been affected either do not dare to talk about it or because they weren't exactly aware of what was happened. To prevent such uh, situations in the future, we should do something about it. Anna will explain detail about our proposals and visions for this matter. So based on what the colleague just said, we have developed different structures of grants, actions and requirements. This should help raise awareness and draw attention to this issue. In view of that, the fact that such discussions as today take place again and again, we have developed the following handling rules. We have a certain code of conduct with role model behavior. We wish for studies without prejudice, studies without discrimination based on gender or culture, and we demand gender neutral language between the lectures and the, and the students and among the students themselves. We demand professional treatment of students and discrimination of any kind must be avoided. Thank you. At the beginning of the semester, I started an online survey to show when, where, and by whom Sexism, sexism is being committed and, above all, how sexism is perpetrated in concrete terms. The results show a clear trend. Of the 63 participants, 68% of them stated that they had been discriminated against during a course. 86% of them experienced sexism by a teacher. 90% of these teachers were male. Students were also given the opportunity to describe in more detail what specifically happened to them. Many were kept down or were even sexually harassed. The following quote or similar remarks of it um, 
sorry, <laughs> um, similar remarks of it. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> where it was particularly common in the survey res responses. My suggestions, my suggestions in class were not taken seriously. I was not listened to at all. Many female students reported losing motivation for their studies and self-confidence after sexist attacks or even going to university with a feeling of anxiety. So what can we do? A big problem is that sexism is still a topic which is not being discussed. We need to create a transparent environment in which sexism can be talked about. Everyone must be shown regularly through campaigns, etc., that sexism is still a problem. We need mandatory seminars that offer opportunities to exchange thoughts and experiences. And we have to make one thing clear. This isn't an action against men or teachers or bosses. This is an action for women. Thank you. I did do a research on um, gender, gender stereotypical behavior in choosing a module in the Master of Architecture at our university. So a module that is a way of, spe of specification in the master's and you can choose two to three subjects in your master's and it's quite a big part of our education. Mm, on the diagram on the left hand side you can see the proportion of female students in the modules of the last year and there is a very big gap in between. So the RT module drawing and visual language has a percentage of 75% of female study students, whereas the technical module structure planning and wood engineering has a percentage of only 25% of females participating. And I asked myself and students why that is the case, and um, the survey produced an answer, which is there is not a gap in, between, in interest in between different genders. Like students, they like the same modules, but this gap happens in self-confidence, especially among women. So female students are, tend to be more interested even in all those modules, but they have much less self-confidence, especially in those modules that are considered to be rather male, that are typically male, like it is engineering studies or economic studies, and they are too afraid or they don't, they have too less self-confidence to choose those modules, um, which leads to a gap in education. And it's quite dramatic because this is the master, so the bachelors was not able to close this gap to, in, to empower all students to choose what they want, not what they think they can do. And so this must be changed in our bachelor studies so we get the education we want and need. Thank you. At our university, TU Vienna, there is a massive lack of women named in courses and lectures. Now an overview, overview about our most alarming results of our research. To start with the most devastating finding, History of Architecture and Art, Part 1 and 2. Among 263 architects and painters, we only find one female architect and no female painter. Construction Design Studio from 2000, 2011 to 2018 includes 50 men and only four women. Pointing out 2021, among seven men, Lina Bobadi was the only female reference. Not only the bachelor is affected. Looking at the application pools in the master degree, a total of 1,102 places were offered for master students and 333 places included gender topics, whereas the demand was 543 places for gender courses. Something has to change immediately. We need to work together in order to inform our fellow men and raise awareness about this important topic. We want more diversity in lectures at university 
more gender courses, an intensive collaboration between the university staff and students at the TU Vienna to work together on the current problems concerning gender equality, one meeting before and after a semester for self-reflection, to include the topic of gender equality in evaluation and surveys of university courses, to include the topic of gender equality in technical lectures, and last but not least, to implement a quota. Thank you for your attention. I would like to present the next group of teachers, uh, professors um, from the uh, Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, who will present us their um, research and seminars with students, um, which is related to the subject where. Um, I'd like to start with Michelle Howard, who is a professor at the Institute of Art and Architecture of the Academy of Fine Arts. Unfortunately, she can't be here today. Um, she is an architect with a practice in Berlin and uh, is a member of uh, Wir Maschenders, an alliance of initiatives found by women and united by the common goal of facing up to worldwide migration with humanity and expertise. And this is also the reason from what I was told why she cannot be here today because she is um, engaged in that matter. But who is here is Eva Sommerecker. She is an Austrian architect. She is a senior scientist at the Institute of Architecture and Arts of the Academy of Fine Arts. She is also a senior researcher at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Design and Architecture um, at the Academy of Latvia. And her research deals with spaces between body and medium. She is also co-founder of iJoy Architecture and Magazine, which is an exhibition space for contemporary architecture in Vienna. And Luciano Parodi, I would like to introduce him. He's an Argentinian architect who lives and works as a senior scientist also at the Institute of Art and Architecture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. After a long years of collaboration uh, on conception and realization of buildings with various offices in Buenos Aires and Vienna, he devoted himself to teaching and his area of interest extends between innovative construction and technology while also including radical ecology and cultural heritage. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's a pity that Michelle cannot join us. Uh, in the description of today's discussion uh, panel, the organizers wrote, the Eurocentric male history of architecture clearly influences today's situation at architecture and planning educational institutions. I would additionally argue the Eurocentric male production of architecture clearly influences today's situa situation at architecture and planning educational institutions. In this regard, I would like to share with you the experience we had last spring um, with a seminar about gender bias in the constructed environment. The frame for this uh, seminar was actually the event which took 
place celebrating 100 years women at the academy with this, um, it was called she or she, come and believe. Um, but even if the starting point were women, soon was obvious that the problem affected an unconsidered majority. Inspired by the book Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Caroline Criado Perez, we investigated the staircases, the window sills, the space allocation program, and asked how people of other backgrounds and genders would have gone about designing them. I mean, we are situated in a historical building um, on the ring, you probably know that, um, by Theophil Hansen. On the basis of this exploration, we made proposals for, let's say, permanent changes or wish for proposals or wish for changes to exactly the Academy's main uh, building at Schillerplatz in the first district of the city of Vienna. This book deals mainly with the consequences of gender data gap. I mean, the group before um, bring these things together. Uh, what's, not, what's not been gathered doesn't exist. This is the case of information and data about women and other majorities, what in time serve as parameters for designing our surrounding. And here's the word where the word anomalies, I um, didn't mention it, our seminar called, was called Women and Other Anomalies, comes from. It's something that, that's not considered in the norm is an anomaly. So, we can only scream, and yes, we scream. In 1978, during a 15-minute performance called Ah, Marina Abramovic and Frank Uwe Leipzien, Leipzien, sorry, shouted at each other, eventually to each other's mouth. The physical distance between the two decreases as the volume of the voices increases. The initial polyphony gradual, gradually beca becomes canon, and eventually degenerates into exceptionally strenuous solos. Only she manage, manages to scream to the end. The scream were instinctive, almost abstract, and as long as breathing aloud. There was intense non-verbal communication. Both artists knew how long the piece would take. But only he allow himself to stop earlier. Was it exhaustion? Did he feel driven out of a space created by hair screaming? What kind of spaces create screams? What kind of spaces needs screaming? When Lucia and Lara, two students of the WAWA seminar, requested rooms to scream at the academy building on Schillerplatz, they are probably doing so out of a visceral need similar to Maria Abramovic. They see screaming as a result of withheld emotions, a woman's necessity. However, it is a non-alarming scream. It is a form of expression. With this room, you claim a room in which you can scream loudly, not to someone, not to yell at, but about something, or rather, to get rid of something. So as a cholera, cholera, colo, corollary sorry, of the WAWA seminar, declarations and announcements, these are we all in front of the Schillerplatz, were screamed in front of the still unfinished and fenced off, uh, off building of the Academy at Schillerplatz. One by one, students unrolled posters and made declarations of intent. These were short, precise, and about all loud. In the background was the object of our desire, the academy building, and a parcel construction manager probably feeling overrun. And this COVID actually put us on the street. Instead of uh, interventions in the building, which was not finished, we decided to make these posters and declarations. 
The time was around noon when most people in the neighborhood go for lunch. At the end of the performance, a frugal intervention was left hanging on the fence of the construction site. A fence on a fence, a set of warnings and denunciations. Our, their claims, are examples of the many unheard of necessity of a majority which historically were not considered in the design and completion of our built environment. The newly renovated and restored historical building of the Academy at Chileplatz is in some cases no exception. It is a display of lack of sensitivity to inclusive accessibility and to gender bias. The building and its renovations suffer from a banal pragmatism when deciding what to prioritize in a public building, historical or not in the 21st century. For example, this entrance that uh, is very difficult to access and this door that's extremely heavy, um, handicapped people should go around the corner where the cars also get in. So this world calendar, some of those are hanging over there, was conceived as documentation and publication of the event at Chileplatz. The claims and ideas expressed on it were only heard and supported as far as they didn't trespass the realm of the manifesto. The constructive world remained for now untouchable. Thank you very much. Today, I will be speaking about Hook Up, a design studio that Michelle Howard and I taught in last fall, in winter semester 2021-22, at the so-called Platform of Construction, Material and Technology at the Institute for Art and Architecture of the Academy of Fine Arts here in Vienna. We had 19 students from different places of the globe. All students produced wonderful and very valuable pieces of work that you can see in greater detail than I will be able to show today on our website, ignored.technology. Let me start by introducing the intellectual point of departure for the studio. Um, so there is Ursula Le Guin's speculation on humankind's first tool that it was likely no weapon, no stone made into a hand axe, for instance, but a carrier bag. So what we distilled from this was that the tools and technology we would like to look at are the ones that bring forward the social and collaborative sides of life, of spending time together and to care. Also, Elizabeth Whale and Barber's 20,000 years of women's work provided invaluable for looking at ways of making thread and textiles while trying to reflect and maybe even get rid of many biases that we all carry along, starting with the studio's topic, a call for the recontextualization of crochet, often considered a craft. A recontextualization of crochet as a form of technology. In order to underline the importance of spinning thread to past societies, it was interesting to fill gaps in our perceptions of history. For instance, the famous statue of Venus de Milo was very likely captured in a posture women would take when spinning threads. Equally, not only looking at European ways of making, we introduced the Bilung, a ubiquitously used net bag of great importance to the people of Milanesia, or rather a wearable and flexible technology, we would argue, that can carry babies, small and large items, and it contracts or expands relating to its content, and which is produced 
from a single thread, an aspect we used as a practical point of departure. In the design studio, we then started to produce our own thread. Instead of using new materials, though, we collected used T-shirts from Caritas and Volkshilfe and cut them into our own so-called T-shirt yarn. From this yarn, students produced large structures that would engage with the human body, or the other way around, that the human body could engage, engage with in different ways. In the picture, you can see the exhibition we built up at the Kunst exhibition space in the Czech city of Brno at the beginning of January this year. A joint show with the Threads and Traces studio taught at the Architecture University in Brno that also looked at the production of thread. Here, I would like to express my thanks to Brno teachers Adam Hudek, Veronika Miskovikova, and the students. We would not have been able to do this without them. Even though this image shows objects ready to be exhibited, the studio's intention was very much to always underline the process of making and to create crochet pieces as complete but open-ended structures. At the Kums exhibition space in Brno, we also found a spot to exhibit the calendars Luciano has just presented before me. To underline the culture of collaborative discussion that was fostered throughout the studio. At this moment, I would like to mention that it was one of our students who told us how happy it made her to be given a space in which talking about feminist perspectives was supported, a comment we need to think further about. I'm happy to have witnessed that many students found their own ways of articulation within this wide field of turning lines into structures. This photo shows Paula's piece where holes allow a human body to peek inside. Also, these holes frame the surroundings in distinct ways. Paula found a language for her very own practice of working on this piece, which she described as, I quote, situational decision-making, quote end. Jules' piece in this photograph is, this, is depicted from the inside. It is a piece that empowers the one who wears it, being able to take many different forms. It can house a person like a nest, but it can also be worn like a collar, turning into a hoodie and a cape. Or it can be a hammock that furnishes the city. Zhiyun started with a Bilom net bag that could be worn on the arm or the leg, and which, by adding holes to it in order to be able to extend the structure, ultimately transformed into a wearable that does not ask for a single way of wearing it, but instead embraces many ways of being. There are many aspects of the studio that I could not cover in this short presentation. We had wonderful workshop sessions all sitting on the floor while being crocheting. And beautiful film works came into existence, um, accompanying the process of making from different perspectives, be it the crocheting hands or even the hooks perspective. Finally, my congratulations go to all the students and to Michelle for their magnificent work. Um, please have a look on our website ignored.technology that shows all works in greater detail. And many thanks also to you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you.
So our next guest is the Gender Task Force from the TU Graz, which will be presented by Peter Peterson and Ina Kukic. Um, we, <laughs> we had a misunderstanding, Sabina and I, so I haven't prepared any short bias to introduce you. I hope you can do this on your own. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, add that to our speaking time. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Petra Peterson and uh, this is Inar Kukic and we both work at the Institute for Construction and Design Principles at the Technical University in Graz. Uh, the Institute was founded 2013. Uh, I'm the professor of that Institute I'm an architect, I have an office in Berlin and a very, very small office in Graz. And uh, I've been working as an architect for about 30 years. Um, I am also the dean of the faculty um, in Graz. Uh, so I've got three jobs, I guess, uh, kind of uh, three different hats. And I think I, 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 I'm going to start this presentation. Do you want to present, sure, do you present yourself later? So this is Ena, she also works there. You know, she will do the, the, the part. And I, I, I'd like to start with, um, maybe on a personal note, first of all, for the students that presented here at the beginning, that I'm very impressed. Uh, I'm also impressed about your self-confidence, because I think at the time when I was your age and I was studying, I would not have had the confidence to stand up in front of a group of people like this and talk about this issue. Um, so thank you very much for that. I think it's a, it's a problem that we battle, a lot of us within architecture, that it takes a bit of time before we start realizing um, what the situation is actually like. Because as long as you're, let's say, um, semi, um, what would you say, successful, you kind of think, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, architecture is hard. Or like I said um, earlier to my colleague, life is hard and then you die, you know, that's a kind of, um, <laughs> and it's, it's hard for everybody. It's hard for the guys and it's hard for the women. It's hard for everybody. It's hard for, um, irrespective of what your background is, but it's just that little bit harder for us as women. And it's even a lot harder for maybe people that do not come from a Western society, and it's maybe even harder for people that are not privileged. Because this is another aspect within the architecture that is often not talked about that you actually have to not only be white, male, and all that, but you also have to be privileged. You have to come from money to be able to be the one that does the big projects, that opens the big office, that gets published in the big magazines. So there's a lot of stuff which is happening in that context around. So I, I became a professor and, and, and uh, founded this institute. and. Um, together with uh, Christina Lien Ortner, who is here as well, who's an assistant and who's been uh, part of our institute for uh, soon 10 years. And uh, she was actually the one that, that started, you know, um, putting forward this issue of that we have to deal with this, we have to deal with our teaching. And um, the problem that we have, like everybody else, about the referencing of the projects and how you actually do that. So that's where it started from. And then also got inspired from the KTH in Stockholm. I'm originally Swedish, and um, so I have a, quite a bit of contact in Stockholm, and I've done, built some projects there as well. And uh, they had done this very, very nice leaflet, uh, which was also uh, uh, done by the students together with tutors um, about all the different issues. Um, which then kind of made me aware of all that. And then I thought uh, when I became dean of the faculty, um, this was a kind of, we had some students at our, <coughs> at our university who kind of uh, started a discussion amongst the students about the referencing material in the lecture, in one specific lecture. 
And then they got quite a big, you know, like it is on the internet, you put in a comment and then suddenly everybody has an opinion and then they got quite um, a big sort of slightly aggressive um, response to that also from, from other students. And then I realized that we are so unaware of the situation. So um, this is when we started the gender task force, which um, Ina is the main uh, person running at our institute. And we started to spread that across the faculty. So uh, we decided it's not enough. We do that in our institute. We have to kind of talk to the others and make use of the fact that I'm a dean, so I've got money. Um, <laughs> I've got a certain amount of power for another year or so until they might throw me out, who knows? I've been doing this for two and a half, three years, see how long it lasts. And also to motivate um, the other students, and I think also the cooperation, we had um, one of our first meetings where we invited all the other uh, representatives from all the other institutes, so about 13, 15 institutes that we have. and. Um, we also invited guests. We had uh, Charlotte Maltes Barth, who, who spoke, who came over a video link. And we had Bernie here from Claiming Spaces here in Vienna uh, to kind of inspire us and to make us feel that we're kind of not on our own out there on the countryside. But there is a whole world of people um, with the same issues. So this is where it started. And I'll now hand over to Ina, who will talk about what we do there. Thank you, Petra. Um, as Petra already mentioned, after this workshop, many different institutes join us in our endeavors to, to make the teaching process more, uh, more equal for everyone involved. And uh, this is a project network of currently active um, projects uh, conducted by several institutes. And they are all really diverse and uh, reflect or better answer to several uh, or many different issues that we are facing right now. You can see that they are uh, quite uh, different in their formats. There are courses, exhibitions, research projects, which are partly uh, PhD dissertations and partly just research projects conducted uh, uh, on certain institutes. But uh, what we all share is, uh, are the tools. Uh, the knowledge that we have, which grows larger every day, and this intersectionality, which was mentioned a couple of times today. Um, I will just briefly uh, mention the, the project of the Institute of Contemporary Art. They were one of the first uh, institutes that, uh, that joined us uh, in this action, and within their course, Why Have There Been No Great Women Architects?, we uh, conducted a questionnaire among students. These were the students of six semesters, so you have to imagine that they have three years of uh, architect uh, minimally three years of architectural uh, education behind them. And one of the questions in this questionnaire was to name ten women architects, excluding Zaha Hadid. And uh, only two out of 76 students were able to actually name those ten women architects. And 71% uh, of them could not name more than five women architects. And this was, of course, just a, a, like a confirmation of, of the things that we were all afraid of. And those are the, the consequences of the current cur curriculum that we have. Uh, but when we go a bit, uh, when we rewind to, to the summer of 2020 and the, the time of the lockdown, the first lockdown, we were supposed to have the annual field trip to uh, Copenhagen at the time, but it was canceled due to Corona. And instead of that, we did uh, some kind of hybrid excursion within uh, own four walls. And one of the tasks that was asked from students to make was to uh, depict human bodies in different interior contexts, in different settings. And out of 140 students, I think, only eight of them were depicting these human bodies as women and all of them were also female students. Um, and after we started making the publication, it just came to us that, that uh, so, not, not so many uh, depictions are accurate, uh, or not to say accurate, but they don't really reflect the, the diversity that we have since more than 50% of our students, or the students of the, this course, were female. Um, also, one of the first things that we did was to conduct a research uh, on how many references in our courses uh, are made by women in architecture. And here you can see a progress from um, Construction 1, uh, compulsory lectures from our Cohen Institute, 
and the difference that one year makes, and this is the year of the activities of gender task force. So uh, in the year 2021, only 4.2% projects referenced were made by women in architecture, and the next, the following year, uh, it almost quadrupled. Also, that happened with, uh, with the project referenced in, in, this, in the same lectures, but uh, done by mixed gender offices. And it is an ongoing process. Um, one of the things we also recently did was, um, also inspired by this questionnaire done with the Institute for Contemporary Art, where one of the questions was to one of the questions was to name a book or essay written by a female author, and only 16% uh, of them could actually name a book written by a woman. So we decided to uh, enrich our own institute's library with a multitude of different books written by architects, uh, but from a women's perspective in architecture or about women in architecture. And also, this is where this intersectionality comes to play because we didn't focus on well-renowned uh, Western female architects. But luckily, since we also in the gender task force come from very different backgrounds, we have here Bodua Khalil, which is originally from Syria, Petra, who is originally from Sweden, uh, Anna Sachsenhofer, who is not here today, she's from Austria, and me, I was born in Yugoslavia. And we bring all of our different backgrounds into choosing the references that we use and also to these books uh, that, we, that we provide for our students. This also inspired another event, which is yet to come. We are planning it for the spring, and this is a human library. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the concept, it's where people, instead of books, are uh, set to disposal for people uh, coming to the event. So instead of reading books, people will have the opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one with uh, women from, uh, from architectural practice and architectural education branch, and they will, uh, they will have the opportunity to ask them about their personal experiences. But uh, outside of all of these uh, actions, there is, there is one uh, omnipresent issue of references, and uh, Petra will say a bit more about that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the problem is a bit, a little bit, because, I mean, we, we were lucky and uh, our percentages were not as bad as the others because I referenced my own material. <laughs> so I can, you know, so, and also with the, with the uh, questionnaires at the EZK, you know, a lot of um, people mentioned my name as one of the women architects, so that's an easy one because they've all met me in first year. Um, <laughs> But I, th I, I think it's quite, I would start, when I started out, I thought, okay, so that's enough. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, I've been published, I'm a professor, and now I'm a dean of the faculty, so I've kind of done my bit, you know? I, I can act as a role model or whatever. And then I started looking at my own lectures, and I, and, and, and I find it problematic, right? So, so I'm, um, being Scandinavian, I'm a, a great fan of Sverifin for instance, of his work, and actually of him uh, as a person, of, of his writings as well. So this is a bit different maybe from architects' offices where you'll talk about the office of, what do I know, Richard Rogers or something, because that's a big team and it's actually completely ridiculous that it's called Richard Rogers or Norman Foster's or whatever, because it's a huge team of people that are working behind there. But, but he... Th 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 it's um, so. So it's a problem which 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 we are faced, and we are faced also with with you know, especially also teaching in the first year of trying to find examples that are sort of obvious. Um, because when you start teaching architecture in the beginning, you want to kind of be obvious, and so we use a lot of uh, museums, kind of icons of architecture historically, and and all that to to show. Um, basic structures or different materials and um, I think that's where the problem is because it has to be so much more if we want to change this it's not enough I can't just replace this with uh, another building uh, that I kind of try and, and rummage through the, 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 the library or the internet and then I replace it with another building because the, the thing is that we women don't actually even get the jobs to do buildings like that, you know, like the Neue Nationalgalerie. So that's where it starts. So, we, so, so, so a lot of us don't actually even have access to that kind of a project in the first place. Um, we then are not also the ones that might get all the architectural 
prizes, because um, who is the jury? Who decides what is good architecture and what is bad architecture? So also in that, who, who decides what gets exhibited in museums? Who decides what is quality and what is not quality? And I think, for instance, that like if we were, we, we've been looking at that, we're looking at schools just now, and, and there it's much easier if you, if you go into contemporary architecture now and, uh, and you look at schools and you look at housing. Um, and especially here in Vienna as well, it's very impressive. There are an enormous amount of women working always in groups with men, one has to say. Uh, and I know I can understand why. I mean, I'm not doing that. I, I am my, my own boss, but um, it's not, it's, it's obviously a lot easier when, you, when you're a team together. But there's a, a lot of very impressive uh, 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 women architects uh, working contemporary with these kind of themes. But why are women working with housing? Why are women not the ones that do the big museums? And do you have to be, like, do you have to change? And, and why do we educate architects um, based on, uh, it, it goes so much deeper because in a way when, when we study architecture, when I studied architecture, we were always compared with all these star architects. And to be honest, I mean, none of us became a star architect of the people that I studied with, very few of them. So is this what, we, is this what we're telling people? So this is the ultimate, this is what you're supposed to become. You're supposed to become the next Mies van der Rohe. And uh, we go and look at the building and, and we go, wow, you know, it's fantastic and it's so great and, and the structure is so fantastic and all that stuff. And this is where we're going to or do we have to change actually our attitude on a much, much more fundamental level of what architecture is actually about and what we should be teaching. So this is the thoughts and the discussions that we are facing and I think that oh and I have to also say before I finish because we've finished now uh, is the uh, we we are publishing uh, Christina Lienautner and me are, are uh, doing this year the Graz architecture magazine which will come out at the end of May beginning of June and where we have lots of interesting artic articles which uh, all talk about the subject beyond the institution and which funnily enough, are nearly all written by women as a coincidence. Okay, thank you very much. The next presentation will be um, a video because Brady Burroughs um, wasn't able to come to Vienna and she pre-produced the video for us. And um, so and Brady is a teacher at the KDH Stockholm we just heard about of. And she's an architectural educator and writer interested in questions of positioning and power, experimental pedagogical practices and making critical ideas accessible beyond academic circles. She is the co-author, editor of Ahmed for Architecture Students, we will hear about that, and the author of Architectural Flirtations, A Love Story, the book you can also find at our book table in the back. Brady works as, a, as head of the second year at KTH School of Architecture, where she also holds a PhD in critical studies of architecture. And we made the race, a is here, as far as I've heard. So we will have her in presence afterwards. Hi, everyone. Uh, from sunny Stockholm. My name's Brady Burroughs, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I'd like to say thank you to Inga and Claiming Spaces for giving me the chance to speak to you from this video instead. And I have a few images I'd like to share with you while I talk. So <clears throat> today, uh, I'm just going to say a few words about the series Feminist Thinkers for Architects, 
uh, which began with a master's seminar course uh, I held at KTH in 2019 with uh, this group of students in the group photo. And it's now continuing with a master's course that Afina held together with Claiming Spaces at TUVN last spring. And this series addresses the main theme of the conference, Who's History, by lifting other voices, uh, as well as this panel's focus on a feminist culture of learning in that it uses critical theory to examine architectural education and ask questions like, how do we become architects? Who gets to become an architect? What else do we need to know besides what we're usually taught? And even looks uh, at how we're usually taught. Uh, and this series of publications is aimed at a practicing designing audience rather than an academic one uh, to make critical ideas more accessible. So the publication also acts as a comment on and complement to the original series called Thinkers for Architects by academic publishers Routledge. And the intention of the original series is to introduce philosophers and thinkers to an architectural audience as a sort of help or a guide in reading these difficult original texts. And on their website, uh, they say the series continues to expand, addressing an increasingly rich diversity of contemporary thinkers who have something to say to architects. So it's a great idea and a great intention. But when we did the first fanzine in 2019, there were 15 titles. Uh, and of those 15, only one thinker was female. And only one among all of the male thinkers was a non-Western or person of color. Now they have 18 titles in the series. And the three uh, new ones are Baudrillard, Freud, and Latour. So unfortunately, the imbalance of representation of other voices has not improved. Um, a note on why I uh, focus on this series, I happen to know of it and I turned to this series in the hopes that they already had Ahmed for Architects so that we could simply read this book together in the course and I would then not have to make a reading list. <clears throat> but when I saw the list of titles that were available, uh, I decided to use the course to start a new series called Feminist Thinkers for Architects in order to lift feminist and anti-racist voices in critical theory and connect them to architecture. Uh, the first fanzine, it throws a lot of shade at the original series, but I would like to say that it's perhaps not entirely the fault of this one particular series. Uh, rather, I see it as it's already built into an academic system uh, that requires researchers to cite these old white guys uh, in order to legitimize their work. And then these are the thinkers we become experts in. And then of course, these are the books that we get. Um, Ahmed uh, even writes about this uh, when she calls for feminist citation practices uh, and talks about how important it is to think about who we cite in our own work. So the idea for the course uh, was to read a selection of one critical theorist's work, in this case, Sarah Ahmed, in a series of regular text seminars uh, that we would then become experts on a feminist thinker who works within the intersection of feminist and queer theory, critical race theory, and post-colonialism. Um, so I made a compendium with five, art five articles that represent five books published between 2004 and 2017. So we also got to see a progression of Ahmed's work. <clears throat> uh, the course setup was that we had an introduction. Uh, we then had five text seminars. Uh, we had two editorial or peer review sessions, and then we had one concluding session. And then all of the fanzine editing and production was done after the course was over. Uh, in smaller groups for the assignment, uh, each group was responsible for preparing one text. 
and that they should bring the Swedish fika, which is coffee and cake for the rest of the group uh, for the discussion. And then the whole group discussed all the texts every week. Um, the assignment was to produce content for this publication to introduce Ahmed's work to other architecture students and to connect Ahmed's ideas to the everyday situation of the architecture student to make them more accessible for students who aren't very familiar with or are even intimidated by critical theory. So in the design and the language and the layout, we also tried to have a less serious approach uh, to make it more fun and to make it something you actually want to read. Uh, I wrote the manifesto as an introduction to the publication. Uh, each group then formulated personal letters to Ahmed about a specific situation in their education using her ideas from their specific article. Uh, each group also added to a type of glossary of key concepts from their article. And then each group contributed three or four important quotes to what we called the Killjoy Survival Kit. Um, there was even a surprise or a gift. Uh, we included our recipe for a favorite fika cake, uh, which we then suggest to the readers that they bake uh, before inviting their friends over to have their own discussions around this fanzine. Um, we printed, folded, and then stapled about 200 copies of this DIY fanzine ourselves uh, to give away and share what we learned with other architecture students at KTH. But we also made it available uh, online as a PDF in the KTH Diva database, which is an open access database. Uh, so students don't have to go out and buy expensive theory books to gain access to these ideas. Uh, where we also included both files for reading on a digital device, uh, as well as the print files, uh, along with instructions on the inside cover of how to print and make your own copy. Um, the fanzine has been really well received and people are finding it and using it in the way we had hoped. Uh, and I would say much thanks to Afina, who included it in her book club and feminist reading list uh, when she was a resident at Arkham. Uh, and she's also invited me to do a podcast and various panel discussions to talk about it, uh, as well as other friends and colleagues who have helped get the word out. Uh, so it's fun to see it turning up in different places. Um, so I decided to expand the series through invited collaborations. And the idea is to use resources that already exist within institutions uh, by giving my course structure to a guest teacher who then focuses on another feminist thinker together with their own students. And uh, then they send the material to me for editing and graphic design and we have a, a release. Um, so I have this ongoing wish list of possible feminist thinkers, um, and I've discussed with a few colleagues about doing the next few numbers in the series. Uh, to test this idea, though, I asked Afina if she would be interested in doing one with her students. Uh, so as we speak, I'm currently editing the second in the series, uh, Lord for Architecture Students. Uh, and it's a collaboration with the Fina Claiming Spaces and the lovely master students at TU Wien. Uh, a Fina was guest professor last spring, and they read a selection from Audre Lorde's Sister Outsider. Uh, I'm now making my way through their material for the next publication, and we plan on having a release in April, May this year, so soon. Uh, and it would also be available for download as PDF, like the other, uh, the first one. I just wanted to show a few, a few pages uh, from the fanzine in progress. Um, the cover sort of reflects this collaboration with Athena uh, and is inspired by her practice with her use of graphic patterns and the color that Athena has called aggressive pink from a previous project. 
Um, and we're still searching for the correct paper for the cover. So this is the cover. Um, it's the same basic setup with a short introduction. Uh, there are the letters, uh, a section on the concepts, important quotes, and a contextualization of this thinker. Uh, however, in contrast to Ahmed's academic texts that were very dense and difficult, uh, Lord's essays are already quite accessible. So the focus with this fanzine uh, will be to show why and how her ideas are relevant to architecture. Um, this time, the group photo reflects the fact that the course took place online during COVID. So everyone is in their own Zoom window. Uh, there's an image from one of the student studio projects to introduce the concepts. Uh, instead of Ahmed's Killjoy survival kit, we now have the Outsiders toolbox in order to dismantle the master's house. And instead of a recipe, uh, the group has curated a terrific uh, Spotify playlist uh, with music inspired by the themes in Lord's essays. And there's a QR code that goes directly to the playlist. Um, Ahmed's academic writing was full of citations to other thinkers whose work she develops and builds upon, uh, whereas Lord's writing is much more essay form. So in order to contextualize her work, we decided to replace the list of reference li references with a timeline. Um, and the timeline places cultural, political, and architectural events in relation to the life of Audrey Lord. Um, we're still uh, working on the graphics and filling it in at the moment. So I just wanted to end with to say, uh, keep an eye out for the release. Um, I assume it will be posted on Claiming Spaces website uh, or uh, one of our Instagrams. Uh, my account is at architectural flirtations with one word. And I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for listening and have a great conference. Thank you. So unexpectedly, but happily, I can introduce Afina. She's here. Um, you've heard a lot now <laughs> about her. She is the founder of the architectural studio of Arai, which considers, considers itself a feminist practice that encourages change on social and spatial issues and that accommodate differences. She's now the head of contextual design MA, de master department at, design, at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. She has been an active educator for years, amongst others, at the Faculty of Architecture at TU Delft, at Ars at TU Wien, and the Sandberg Institute. And she has been a guest lecturer at Columbia University in New York, at KTH in Stockholm, and the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence. Her design research, maybe some of them have seen this, the multiplicity of other, was commissioned for the Dutch Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial in 2021. And I'm so happy she's here I mean, this morning. We thought we will never meet in this, in person, in this life. There's something. So please welcome Afina. so much uh, for that introduction, Inga. Uh, hello, everyone. I just got off a plane. Uh, so yeah, I just have to switch gears for a second, but I'm very happy to finally make it to Vienna. It's my first time, um, even though, of course, uh, last year uh, I was a guest 
professor, the first claiming spaces guest professor, which all happened online and I didn't make it uh, out to Vienna, but I'm here. KLM tried to tried to put a stop to it. We kind of, I was mid-air and then they said, look, the wheels don't work, <laughs> we're going back. And I was like, ah. oh well, so yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be in this first panel. I think it's great that we're asking these questions. Um, it's definitely, the questions kind of exemplify the reality in which I have been an architect. Uh, it exemplifies the reality in which I was educated still, so that, <laughs> I mean, I started studying in 1995. So that's a long time ago. And I think it's pretty creepy also sometimes to see that we're still there, but luckily we have, um, <coughs> collectives like Claiming Spaces and many, many others who are asking the right questions and encouraging change. Um, as Inge said, well, I mean, uh, I've been practicing with my own studio, Afarai, uh, based in Amsterdam since 19, uh, 2005. And um, I think when you start practicing at first, you're just trying to figure out what direction you want to go in. But slowly over the years, I think I, um, it became clearer to me that kind of feminism, feminist theory was really at the heart of, you know, the ideals that I had. Um, and I've always been kind of trying to articulate what it means to have a feminist architectural practice. Uh, and in that sense, for me, it boils down to the, these two things. I always write them down. Um, well, one is that, I, I'm very attracted to represent people and cultural movements that are traditionally not represented within the kind of the spatial field. Um, what does that look like? You know, what are the, what are their stories? What are the relationships they have to the contexts and the sites in which we uh, practice? Uh, and then I think on a more kind of broader level, really my aim is with the projects that I do that I'm interested in um, encouraging change and figuring out how to kind of merge social and spatial issues and how, how difference can actually be uh, something that fosters creativity uh, and also fosters our practice as architects. So as I said last year, I was uh, the, the visiting, visiting professor here uh, and this, the studio uh, was called A Space of Freedom. Uh, and it was quite literally a space of freedom because we started reading Audre Lorde's uh, Sister Outsider. It's a collection of essays. Uh, Brady already uh, kind of spoke about it. But I think, you know, it was also a space uh, to experiment on how to educate. Uh, and instead of giving a really uh, detailed brief of what the site was and what the subject was, we had this book, Sister Outsider, that was the starting point. And basically the first weeks uh, we started reading uh, and kind of analyzing wh wh what she was saying and how that relates to kind of architectural practice. Uh, out of that, the students kind of had to formulate or could formulate their own proposition, their own kind of uh, intervention, spatial intervention. And out of that came a very wide range of uh, projects. Uh, and what I found very interesting, what happens when you have that freedom? you know, to articulate by yourself uh, what you find valuable. And also, what do you find in, for instance, the work of a poet, of a writer like Audre Lorde? Uh, there's also a lot of freedom there to interpret and to take with you kind of different information that you would maybe normally not use while developing an architectural project. And I think it was a struggle, of course. It's not something that we do a lot, <laughs> or students do a lot. And I think, of course, that kind of translation was uh, at times also, yeah, quite frustrating for them. Or when it comes to kind of finals, you know, like, what do we need to produce? You know, normally we get a list. <laughs> and it was really like, yeah, well, I mean, you kind of have to figure out how um, the project that you have made, how you can best tell that story and best kind of put across what it's about. Uh, I think the students did really, really well, all of them. Um, yeah, I should have actually included more slides, but yeah, I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> I think we can, ah, they're here, okay, so great, so that's, that's already done. They will also be uh, in the fanzine. Um, 
I think in general, within my practice, of course, feminist theory is very uh, important. At the same time, I'm also very much interested in kind of um, bridging the gap between what we do in academia, what we do in theory, uh, and kind of translate that to an actual uh, design. You know, like what does that look like? Or what could it look like? And of course, that's only from my hand, but I would like uh, that kind of also the aesthetics, you know, it's like whose history, but also whose aesthetics. Um, and that we can kind of see if we can formulate also an architectural language that kind of represents difference. So this is one excursion. Uh, it's also something that I am trying out now is basically also in the images to consistently kind of use my cousins or my aunties. And you know, because it, like for, for 30 years I've seen kind of suburban families, uh, you know, as if that was kind of the aim. So what happens if you also kind of, I'm also subconsciously just doing that because that's my reality. Um, and it's, it's actually quite funny. I work for a lot of musea as well and you kind of offer the sketches <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, I hope we can get to that demographic. And it's like, yeah, maybe that's an aspiration just from this image, you know? Um, and kind of uh, four or five years ago, I started working, uh, also kind of making more autonomous uh, spatial interventions because I was really looking for kind of a free space outside of architecture uh, in which I could test some of the ideas that I had. Um, and I think kind of the art world gave me a little bit of a space. Uh, and this, for instance, was like one of the first projects. It's also so it's kind of like the first iteration in kind of creating that new form language. This was called the City of, City of the Sun. Sorry, okay, now I'm like getting really hot. <laughs> but oh well. So I think that kind of culminated in, uh, in the Venice uh, Biennale. So the contribution for the um, Dutch pavilion uh, was called the Multiplicity of Other. Uh, and it was a spatial installation and in a way kind of the opposite of, you know, this very modernist, wide, rational, beautiful, concrete space. Uh, I wanted to create a space that was kind of uh, transparent, flowy, light. It didn't touch the building at all at any point, um, but it also it had these different transparencies, so you had different relationships to the people who were moving through it, and within, we actually designed it as a performance space, but we couldn't do performances uh, and talks because of the pandemic. Um, because the idea was that in this space, we would kind of, together with different thinkers, architects, artists, would kind of figure out, you know, like, what is at the basis of making a different architecture? You know, if we want to do something else, if we want to do it otherwise, don't we also need uh, different methodologies? Uh, methodologies uh, that are outside of kind of this paradigm that we're, this very narrow paradigm that we're being taught. Um, and it was not, so it's kind of methodologies that I was interested in, um, values, really at the basis of it, um, but also knowledge. So uh, we had these different interviews, we taped them in Amsterdam and then kind of put them within the space and you could kind of move through the space and, and uh, think about it. I think the larger idea of the multiplicity of other is that we're now, especially institutionally, uh, institutionally if, if it's in education or in the arts, we're very concerned with kind of diversity. Um, and I think these are some examples, right? For me, if I think about it, so inclusivity, we're gonna make a little space, a little space. And then polyphony is also a very nice word that we love in Holland at the moment. Ah, we're gonna make a little bit more space, you know, like different people can say different things. Um, but I think really the idea of the multiplicity of other is that it's a world within itself and it has existed for many, many, many centuries. You know, and that also concerns kind of the spatial world that we uh, as practitioners sh should actually inhabit and be aware of. So really it identifies kind of spatial knowledge of this overwhelming majority that is out of kind of the paradigm that we are taught within the architectural schools as fundamental if we want to understand this complex world and if we want to design for that complex world. And just to give like a, a, a quick example, um, I was reading, uh, architect Mario Gooden's book, um, Dark Space, 
And he was talking about, for instance, the, um, the bush arbors. So there are kind of these spaces that people created when they fled plantations or uh, enslaved situations. Um, and I think, I mean, it's just an example out of thousands of examples that you, that you can take. But kind of this, the spatial practice uh, is much wider than the architectural practice. Uh, and I think it has been there for many, many centuries. Uh, and it's something that we kind of have to become uh, eloquent in as well. Um, and it's not only space, it's also how people relate to space. It kind of goes into the whole idea of, you know, how even we, how we teach about the site. You know, is the site uh, a, a container in which we just put things? Or is the site a subject that is filled with different relationships, with different histories, and whose history matters within that space? Uh, what relationships do we value? Which knowledges do we want to take from that uh, to use as a basis to create design? Um, and one of those things is also the canon. You know, we have, of course, the beautiful Pritzker Prize, which is finally uh, showing some inclusivity. Um, but at the same time, I think we also need a very different canon. We need a very wide canon. Um, and for the Venice Biennale, we also made kind of a video installation kind of pinpointing 40 women. I think 40 women is way not enough, but <laughs> it should, it's extensive. I think everyone should add to it. Uh, and the piece was called The Mothers or Them Others. Uh, basically 40 women who are at the basis of you know, ecological thought, um, activism, spatial activism. Uh, activism. Um, oh, oh, here it is. I don't know if it works. Well, maybe. Uh, I don't know if my video works, but uh, we're gonna try. Oh no, it doesn't. Well, it's okay. Um, it was beautiful. <laughs> well, and then, I mean, we also need different vocabulary, and that why I was very happy uh, when I met the amazing people uh, from Claiming Spaces that there was this beautiful glossary because I'm super into words, you know. I think for me, I felt when I read it that, oh, these are all the words that are missing. These are all the word, word, words uh, because of which we're not able to kind of fully explain some of the architectural projects that we want to do. You know, some of the definition, definitions are so needed within the profession. Um, so uh, I was so uh, happy when uh, Claiming Spaces agreed to kind of uh, collaborate and put it in the exhibition uh, in Venice uh, and also to kind of visualize it. So, I mean, what does uh, what does, uh, let's say, toxic masculinity look like in architecture, you know? Uh, so I don't know if this video actually works, but... Well, I'm just gonna let it slide. Uh, and then you can uh, look. And then this is the uh, manifesto for the multiplicity of others. So, well, so you have to look at two things at the same time, but I think that's fun. Yeah, <laughs> actually. Yeah, so the glossary first does all the words, and then we kind of go into, you know, what is accessibility? Uh, I think this is really a, a nice example of kind of this anti-architecture. Um, of course, it goes really slow, so. I'm just gonna skip a little bit, see if I can find toxic masculinity. <laughs> Here, this is mansplaining. I like this one. It's a very good uh, critic session. Um, of course, I, I think we didn't find images for everything, but oh no, I, I missed the T. Oh well. Uh, here, look, Miss has a sovereign eye. Ah, oh, here. Oh yeah, I love this one. <laughs> you know, he was just, just defacing it. Yes, go for it. Um, I mean, maybe w one more uh, project to illustrate. Let's see uh, if I go to the next one. Uh, where's my arrow? So, oh. 
Yeah. Look at it. It's online on our website since yesterday. Yay! Okay, great. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, and then I was thinking, you know, um, whose history, who, who's valuable? I, I, I was asked to make a, a pavilion, to design a pavilion in, uh, in, in Stockholm. That's also where I met Brady Burroughs. And um, I don't know, I, w I was very much interested in in, I am very much interested in public space. I think that's where much of my practice kind of resides, but I'm always learning about public space. So in that sense, I was very interested to kind of figure out how women relate to public space. So to make this pavilion, I, uh, over a year, I did different workshops uh, with different groups of women in Stockholm. And I think what I, I learned many things, uh, I learned that um, participation is, uh, is a thing, you know, it's something that we say we always want to do, but it's actually, it's not that easy, you know, so you have to be very, very clear. And I think luckily out of other projects I had learned that, so we could have kind of a, um, we had an honest uh, conversation about <laughs> uh, how much design I would do, what I would design, and it, what I needed kind of to do with them, uh, what I found important. But most of all, I wanted to learn about their daily lives within that city, you know? And I think what was really astounding was that everything was about safety at first, you know? So I have to be able to see who approaches the pavilion. I have to see who's behind it. I, I want to see transparency. So it was really interesting kind of also uh, as a woman myself to kind of figure out, oh yeah, I do relate to public space, not on this high level because I came in kind of like, how do you relate to public space? And I was like, what, <laughs> what are you asking me? Uh, but that really, I also navigate public space out of safety concerns at first. And I, I didn't really realize that until I was talking to um, the women of, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, so we did all these different workshops. We worked on kind of figuring out what would happen there, what they wanted to do there, how they wanted to relate to each other. Um, and then out of that, now we're building this pavilion in the, the park. It's going to be a performance pavilion. Um, it has all these speakers built inside in which people can send their own music and go roller skating. Uh, it has like a little basketball court. Um, but then the pandemic hit and of course uh, it was put on hold. So what we did in the summer before is uh, basically a body scan people. We invited lots of the people we worked with but also in general the people in the area to kind of uh, visit the pavilion digitally. Uh, and I think one of the frustrations I had when I was designing it, because I was designing it for real life women, was that I only found these really annoying little skill figures of women and you know, the, the basically you have to put the hands on and they're like this, or they're like this. Um, so through the body scanning, uh, people also gave me the permission to use, uh, use their bodies as scale figures. So it's a really like, it's 180 people um, working on making it uh, available. Uh, so we can also have like real life bodies within our scale figures, uh, within our scale models, if anyone still makes real models, which I do, which I love. Um, and then maybe just to finish off uh, a little vi uh, visit to the digital pavilion. Um, uh, does this work? Yeah, great. <laughs> oh, works. Yeah. It's kind of an old version, like it's bigger now and with different graphics, but I think it's, it was nice to see the real people there <laughs> coming out. Mm. Here's everyone. Um, yeah, I, maybe that's a little bit abrupt, but uh, thank you.
So we go on with the discussion and um, would like to ask our speakers to come to the podium or which one because we have been so many so we had to select who is allowed to discuss. <laughs> no. Um, no, we won't make it. We, I think we will open it very um, immediately into the public. Can you? So thank you for all these great inputs, very interesting, and also the call for action was really nice. Um, so are there any questions? Also, our listeners from YouTube are hardly invited to ask any questions. From um, Okay, hopefully there are questions now. There's <laughs> Any questions? No, not yet. Yeah? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I would have a question for uh, Afaina. I hope I pronounced it yeah, correctly. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one of your first slides actually reminded me of a problem that we have in, uh, reference in updating our own references. You started with the slide, if I'm correct, uh, one of the photos was of Beyonce's, uh, yeah. And as we know, uh, other than being a cultural icon, she's also known as a person who holds a bit of a power and who used it also to build her fashion brand by using laborers who are also disadvantaged from another country. And uh, it reminded me of a problem that we also have when picking references for our projects, also when there are of women in architecture, what happens when these women are uh, reproducing the problematic narratives, and how do we um, how do we distinguish this cultural context and what is important and what is maybe the main message from all the things that come with it that we maybe don't really contextualize in our in our courses? Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not really a question, right? It's more like a, how how do we deal with that? Yeah. Great. Um, I think it's hard anyway, you know, like I, I feel if we look at architecture as a whole, I think it's like I want to talk about kind of the architecture of care in a way, but then I find it very hard to kind of engage, for instance, in that kind of discussion because we have so m many care and labor issues at, at the heart, you know, within the schools, within the within the offices, you know, within kind of labor practices, when we're building, uh, how we're using material, you, you know, like I, I think it's just everything is so entrenched in everything. Um, and in that sense, I, I don't know, like how to deal with that. I really try to break it down to, to the level where when I'm designing or building something that I always try to do it locally, I try to do it in a way that it's circular. Uh, so I, I try for myself at least to care about the labor practices also in my studio with the people I work with. But yeah, I mean, I, I totally see what you're saying about, <laughs> about Beyonce, but I think we have that within our own house as well. You know, we have it within, within our own schools as well. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm also the head of, of a department. I mean, everyone in our situation has a precarious situation, right? All the teachers, all the heads. So I think we also have to, yeah, you know, like some parts are good, some parts are bad, but I, I hope that we can all kind of figure out within our own houses also how to fix that. Uh, I don't know if that's an answer, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Any more questions? Okay. Not sure if I see everybody. So I have a question on my own. Um, maybe to Petra Peterson and I find it a young uh, as to practicing architects. Um, I do my own research on gender planning in school architecture and my question would be like, how would inclusive architecture in educational architectures, also like school buildings, look like to dismantle discrimination in an intersectional and feminist way? <laughs> Big question. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's. A, okay, sorry. I have to switch on. Uh, yeah. Also a good question. It's funny. I, I get asked the question a lot. Like, what does the feminist city look like? What does an intersectional architecture look like? You know. And it's really. I don't know. I think there will be many, many forms. You know. As we all start to practice in a different way with a different consciousness, I hope we. In, in the end, it will look in many, many different forms. But I do think that, um, yeah, we can apply it on different uh, levels, you know, this thinking. And um, uh, what I would say, I think for me, really, it goes to many levels. I like to use the intersectional framework to position myself within a project. Where am I in relation to a kind of power and oppression? Where are the people who I'm designing for within that framework? Um, I also like kind of, you know, just ideas like from the margin to the center, you know, what, is that, what does that even mean? Uh, and then often we get into these discussions like, yeah, but if we have to design for people who are, uh, you know, who suffer from, who, who are less, I don't know, less able is not really or rightly phrased, but uh, what if I have to design for a queer black woman in a wheelchair? You know, that is so specific. Uh, I think that's really like problematic. And it's always that I say like, look, we have been designing for this very specific person. Like modular man is a very specific man, you know? I mean, even for Truvius man, it's, I mean, it's quite like, it's a very narrow thing. So even kind of those ideas that we figure out that what we're doing that was universal is actually like very specific. I think then we can also start to apply kind of these different uh, ways of designing actually really specifically, but for a wider group of people. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. It's just a little, some of my thoughts on that. Uh, maybe some more thoughts, yeah. Um, I, it, it, it is a really difficult question. I mean, I, I um, for instance, I've converted a Nazi bunker for, as a museum and built a penthouse on top of it in um, concrete, uh, in situ concrete. So I ask myself, is that a feminist architecture? I guess the destruction of the bunker might be feminist in a way, but I, I, I think when you start looking at it in a sort of style and... Um, starts becoming a bit difficult. Um, I think what's much more important is maybe that one, um, one needs to learn uh, quite early on or work with this uh, architecture in itself um, has to be designed for um, you, 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 your, your responsibility as an architect to d design for society as a whole. And, and that's quite difficult because we, we kind of go between this idea of that we have to have these fantastic design ideas and then at the same time we have to think about all the users and things like that. And the more public projects you do, the more you have to kind of, you're always forced to go into sort of average standardization. So it's quite, you know, when you design a, a sort of penthouse for an art collector, it's quite easy, you know, he's... He says he likes to have his shower that way, and his wife says she wants to have this, and you know her workspace that way, and stuff like that. But when you design a, a housing, social housing, for instance, you, you you're faced with standardizations, and these standardizations have been based on a standard ideal uh, family situation with standardized normative ideas of how um, the world should look like, and. Um, 
that's quite difficult. It's difficult in your conversation with a client of trying to provide a multitude of spaces or provide spaces that can be for a multitude of people. But I think that's where we have to start. You know, we have to start in the in actually looking at at uh, who we are doing this for, and 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 maybe it's not so important in. Um, kind of trying to classify it in specific styles or, or ways of working, but it has to be the, um, the theme behind it or, or the thought about the people. And the more we get to know about all the different types of people that they are and the more open we are towards it, the more open we are to a society that allows for more than the standards, the better we can produce architecture that reflects this. I think this is why actually it should be a much greater part of architectural education to to learn about culture and, and uh, sociology and things like that. I don't know. I have... It's kind of difficult to sit and speak like this. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. This sort of feels really weird. Uh, so I'm going to just destroy this. And throw so. my name on the floor. Right. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so I have a question. Oh. I have a question to Paula and Janina, uh, or Janina, sorry. I don't know how to correctly pronounce it. Um, so you, in your presentation, you've made, a, it was like a very uh, great work analyzing your current like status quo and actually you've used like this strong language of we demand and I like it's really amazing and I just wanted to ask are you organizing and like what comes next who are you so you you have these demands which are very clear but how do you plan to or who are you in touch with or yeah just curious to know So we prepared, uh, in our course, we prepared a manual with all our demands and um, we will try to um, like pub not pub publish, publish it, it um, so that as many people as possible at our university um, can reach out to um, our demands and can inf inform themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and we're hoping that something is changing um, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I also think that, so we, ha oh, okay. <laughs> um, we have like two courses that are facing gender issues um, today at TU Vienna, this is the transcript course and also the scientific seminar. And I think to realize those um, demands, we need to um, move on with these courses and um, over the next years and really try to um, reach out uh, for the, uh, to the um, heads of the university and really say, okay, this has to be addressed now, we need to make a change. And maybe um, there is a m more, so we need more of these courses mm -hmm. to really realize all of our hopes and wishes and demands and, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I might conclude. Uh, I was, can I comment? <laughs> Speak very loudly. <laughs> you have to sign, give a sign that you want to. <laughs> so now I can speak. Yes. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I would like to, to just, um, 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 just to, to comment on that because I, I, I think what's really important for us to understand is that um, this issue of um, emancipation and of feminism and of, of, of seeing these problems which are there is, is also um, a problem. It's not like because I'm a woman I am a feminist. I, I think that has to be really uh, my, in, 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 I mean I'm, I'm working as the, I'm the only female dean. Um, 
I'm actually the only woman in a lot of situations. Uh, and we have 120 professors at the TU Graz. We have 10 women altogether. So, I mean, you know, um, it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite a long way to go. But I do have real problems uh, with the administration as well. And there, my counterparts are female. And um, their emancipation is not very, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem when you when you're trying what you are actually allowed to do and allowed to say as a woman in, in a situation of being a boss. And um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really big issue of education on all fronts. We, we need to educate everybody within this issue and we also need to educate ourselves. So I just... Maybe can, uh, I can add um, a bit of an anecdote um, yeah, to this... Uh, last comment that Petra just said, we need to educate ourselves. Um, I had quite a moment, I must say, last summer, when Michelle and I started to think about what we would be teaching together. And uh, yeah, we were talking in English because Michelle is Irish. And um, yeah, then she said, yeah, why, um, yeah, why not doing something with crochet? And then I was asking her, What's crochet? I've never really come across that word. And then that's, it's häkeln. And I was just wondering why, I, I mean, I, yeah, I kind of, of course English is my second language, but then I got in contact quite a bit with English during my studies, also was partly educated in the UK. And uh, yeah, so I was educated to um, maybe discuss these, uh, like the thinkers of the Routledge series for, for example, um, so I'm, I'm really thankful for also the, the vocabulary that now um, yeah, I've been introduced because uh, yeah, we maybe need also the, the words to, yeah, to talk about. And, and, and the, yeah, so I, I just realized to what extent I'm also educated um, to kind of um, yeah, continue the existing narratives that we have. So uh, yeah, crochet is just a, it's, it's a tiny word and uh, yeah, it, it, it's very complex because uh, yeah, it, it's also yeah still considered a craft, and this is what our studio was uh, trying to do to actually uh, yeah recontextualize that and to look at it as a form of technology. So um, yeah, this is just um, yeah, it just made me think uh, yeah like why. Is that? I, I like I like that you talk about crochet because I actually had like one of my tutors telling one of my students like, she wanted to do something with crochet as well, and he's like, "Yes, but that is such a girly material, you know." And I think it's really like something that you, he just said, and then something that we have probably all kind of experienced that you know is ah, it's just a joke or it's just something. I said, you know, but luckily this student got so pissed and she wrote like this amazing email and then she kind of like took him completely to school on kind of the materialization and gender. And uh, I thought it was great, you know, just to see kind of student activism and educating tutors, you know. Uh, well, he's not teaching in my department anymore, but <laughs> that's also nice of being the boss in a way. But um, yeah, I thought that's interesting also in material wise, you know, like why can't concrete be a feminist material, you know, like it's, it's such a, we have these kind of biases already within our uh, material vocabulary, you know, so yeah, I think also kind of to subvert that is really interesting within the design education. I'd like to come back to your question uh, regarding the, the students, the seminars and the results and how to deal with them and um, maybe give you a bit of an overview that at the TUV and we have, um, even before the claiming spaces collective was formed, we have a little bit of history of um, doing seminars um, with um, contents in, you know, in the feministic gender field and um, the idea is that we um, kind of come up with all the, 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 the results that came out of it 
um, all the different seminars and courses um, at some point this year um, with a kind of manual which includes um, you know the findings but also the demands and really serving as a kind of basic um, a, a paper and information that can really be available at the faculty for everyone and uh, this relates to students as well as to teachers and uh, at the level of the deans so um, I think it's, it's so important that students are given the opportunity even to deal with uh, the situation in their own educational environment and um, from all the seminars we, we have done um, up to now this, these two probably were the ones which dealt most closely with um, really looking into the situation at the faculty and uh, we are, you know, it's architecture and spatial planning but this was um, architecture students only so we did not really look into the um, spatial planning area but uh, there are a lot of architecture students at um, the DTU so it's about 5,000 so and we were like, you know, 30 students um, in, in the courses so there's it can be topped, so there can be many more students ideally or, or other teachers as well being um, participating in dealing with all these subjects, which is so important. So I think we have time for one more question that is from our live stream chat. Um, and I think this is adding to, to your discussion um, and it deals, um, it's to not, no one specific, so I will just read it out. Um, it's from Emir Kulacic. How to research the difference and struggles within the feminist discourse? So, I mean, um, we heard from uh, three different architecture schools and dealing with different methodologies, and I think it was all very different. Maybe one of you or some of you want to um, elaborate a little bit on this um, how and um, maybe the focus of your feminist research. <laughs> I can repeat it if you want. <laughs> so it's um, how to research the differences and struggles within feminist discourse. Oh, you didn't understand, so no. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how to research the differences and struggles within the feminist discourse. So this is a um, question from the, our live stream, and um, it's to no one specific, but um, we talked about these different um, uh, methods of research at all your different architecture schools. So um, I think, that, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I hope now it's yeah, more clear. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically, I could answer for Theo Graz. Uh, it's something which uh, we wanted to show today, but since we had uh, not that much of a not that much time, uh, you can also see it here on our poster of Project Network, because we have uh, these various projects, and some of them are research projects. Uh, some of them are PhD projects. For example, um, one institute is dealing with uh, female architects of Italy in the past century, and it's one of the ongoing research projects, but there are, of course, many others. Uh, Roseanne here from Institute of Contemporary Art, they have their own uh, ongoing project which focuses on women in architecture branch uh, during the global Cold War, right? And there is also an ongoing research on the Institute of uh, um, Building Typology, Gebäudelehre, which focuses on collective models of housing which were primarily built uh, due to uh, necessities of women. And so there are so many different areas which you can research on, and we have our own research within our institute that was started two years ago, Beyond Boundaries, uh, how, to, how to make a teaching process more inclusive. So uh, I suggest you get in touch with the claiming, uh, with <laughs> gender task force and also claiming spaces, but also to take a look at our uh, uh, poster here. I think it will be helpful, like a good overview or of all ongoing projects. Thank you. So, any more questions? Oh, so many. Okay, because it's already ten past three, 
Like they were we said we would go on till quarter past because quarter past. then we go out we go on outside so I think we can okay, nice. have so a then, smaller break. It's and yeah, it's not really a question, rather a thank you and also for the students and also as a student from the TU myself, I really hope that all my male professors are in the Zoom meeting listening because I don't really see any of them here. Yeah. Okay, jetzt darf ich die Maske aufnehmen? Okay. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your uh, contributions. Uh, to, to keep it short, actually, because I have a, I think I, 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 uh, I'm afraid of a quite basic uh, question, so therefore I want to keep it as short as possible. I was um, coming back to the word of educating people, and I was wondering, who do you want to educate? Of course, it's fine to educate yourself or myself or ourselves here, that's fine. But uh, if, you, if I did understand you correctly, I did understand that you want to educate everybody through architecture, through design. Does this mean that you are going to repeat a traditional uh, inner contradiction of modernism? Uh, which also wanted to educate everybody by design, or is it just a very specific kind of educating, and who do you want to educate, and by which means? I think, uh, I think it's important to become very precise uh, with these uh, instruments, because we had this topic already for a long time, and therefore I was just curious, how do you address this? And, um, I, I was being very generalizing. I was really just talking about the architecture school, um, uh, seeing the education within the architecture school. I do not have, I do not believe that I can educate anybody else. I, I don't actually think I can educate anybody, to be honest. I think I can just provide a, a situation in which I can give, um, help the students um, emancipate themselves and give them the tools to find their own education or their their to work within um, using what is, explaining what is available to them within the institution for them to, to educate themselves. But I was specifically talking about architecture schools. I don't think architecture educates anybody. I think architecture has to be, um, um, provide a certain shelter for things to happen within it and uh, provide a space for different things being able to happen within it even things that I might not have thought of myself as an architect when I designed it. So this is my, you know, I do, it's, uh, it's really just about teach, you know, what do you teach? How do you teach? Or do you, you know, what do you see yourself as at the university? So unfortunately, we have to stop here now because I, I know now why the, the colleagues from TREAT get nervous because they have to change the techniques outside. So, um, yeah. So we will stop here, and for the second panel, we will see us, see us outside. So, and it was planned to start at half past three, but let's see how long. <laughs> It'll take. I'm sorry, I was not thinking about that. <laughs>